in a crude laboratory in the basement of his home. You get hooked up with Micah. Uh, we used to work at the same firm. Oh yeah, down in what, down in Texas was it? Yeah, I'm out of Louisiana, but we worked under this. We were in the same region, and I heard him uh heard him on a call one day, and I was like, huh. I really like what he had to say because he was building it with cold outbound. And that's kind of my thing. I'm not from where I'm at. And so I just, I liked what he had to say and I knew he had kicked ass. So I kind of started picking his brain and then one thing led to another. And oddly enough, we've still never met in person. You guys have never met in person. Mm -mm. Ah, that's funny. And how long you been doing the letter? Um, I guess. Maybe 11 months. I left in January uh, and joined a new firm and then started playing around with it at the end of last year. But I mean, I don't know. It didn't really become a thing until a couple months in. So just to be quite honest with you, I had. I just I I really found the industry hard. I heard a lot of competing advice. And when I reached out to Micah, when I, I was in probably year one, he was he was saying stuff that, you know, most kind of went against traditional wisdom, networking, all that. And so I told him, uh, it, it, what, I guess what I'm saying is what he told me really helped me. And so I started to see some success. And as he mentored me and we went along, I, I reached I basically told him, I was like, listen, I know online marketing because I've been doing this for a while on the side, just projects. And I was like, I can take what you know and put a nice little bow and brand on it and we can take it out there. I said, because I'm sitting in cubicles next to guys that are having the same issues I'm having. Like everybody I talk to that's a new producer, you know, they struggle most of the time. There's like a 90, 95% failure rate. I was like, there's a really big need for this. Like, how do you how to build the book for the rest of us. You know, like if you don't have a prestigious name in your community or you weren't handed seated business, like how do you do this thing with cold outbound from scratch? And yeah. there's really yeah. nobody that had really covered that. I felt like, um, or I couldn't find them. You know, I thought Randy Schwantz's stuff was, you know, pretty revolutionary. I can only imagine what it was at the time, but it was like, okay, well that's great. But like, how do I open the door? How do I get in? How do I build lead lists? How do I prospect? And um, I just thought there was a need for it because I was basically like the same age old thing. Like you just, you make, you create what you needed. Right. And it's kind of, that's kind of what it was. Yeah. I, um, have you spent any time with like David Carruthers stuff in the killing commercial uh, community? So I've talked with David a number of times. Um, I've never gone through his course uh, or whatever his system is. Um, but I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, the dude's, He's an, he's a good, he writes a lot of business, so yeah. he knows what he's doing. Yeah. The cold outreach stuff is really interesting. Um, I initially, my entire agency was going to be based on cold outreach. Um, you know, when rogue risk, when I first went to launch rogue risk, it was, it was going to be a middle mark, like a digitized middle market agency. So essentially I didn't want to take on the overhead of having a huge office and all the stuff that normally comes with it, but I was going to be. 50 to a hundred miles from my home, you know, doing middle market stuff, just doing it digitally. And I, you know, knew there were ways to deliver the same services, et cetera. Um, I had a Cincinnati appointment and I was like, I'm going to, this is good. You know, this is going to be what I do and it'll be great. And, um, and then COVID hit and every potential prospect, you know, was gone and no one was answering the phones and we had to pivot to what we are today, which is really this digital marketing based inbound small business shop just to survive. But my, my point in saying that is, is only I think that every producer in the country could have an established, um, profitable, consistent book of business if they were willing to pick up the phones and do cold outreach and you know maybe some of the other cold outreach stuff if they like letters or drop-ins or whatever your whatever your way of doing it is but like this is absolutely a method for all the financial freedom that you want and no one will fucking do it 
like no one will do it. I mean, it's just like, I, because I've been doing a version of what you guys are doing for 12 years now. I have been speaking to insurance professionals about how to grow a book of business for more than a decade. And I have become, I'm so glad that like you guys are here because I hate talking about the things that you guys talk about. Like I'm so sick <laughs> of it. I hate it. Like I just, I can't even take it anymore because there's like a couple ways to make money in this industry. All of them involve work. And what it comes down to is you either want to do the work or you don't. It's not like I'm not good at cold calling. Yup. Everybody sucks at cold calling until they do it a whole bunch and then you get better at it. Well, I'm not good at being on video. Yup. Everybody sucks at being on video until they do it a whole bunch and then they get better at it. Like I just, I can't, I get, I get like at this point, I'm like unapologetically fed up with the people who read everything, listen to everything and do nothing. You know what I think? I have a little bit different slant on that, but it's still kind of the same thing. It's like, I actually think that most producers are willing to do the work. They just hear competing advice. And so they don't know which one to do. And so if you tell me that if I just go to lunch with a couple of people a week, or I can make 200 cold calls a week, which one do you think I'm going to choose? Well, they're always going to take the easier option. The pro this right. is Again, this goes back to, I, I think it has to do with a general sense of most people talk shit, but are actually just lazy at the end of the day. And this goes for, for everything. This isn't just insurance professionals, but I think our industry tends to really shine a bright light on it. It's like, you know, I, I I do the I use YouTube, right? So YouTube is one of the areas where I have had a tremendous amount of success success multiple times in my career. And there's a very simple path, which I literally have given away for free for a decade. Do this, make money. It's that easy. I've seen middle market guys use it. One of my best buds, Gordon Coyle, gets venture capital firms to send him six figure premium E and O accounts through the philosophy that I taught him with YouTube marketing. Dude, there's a handful of people in the entire country that have ever actually done it. It's right there. Boom. It is work. You it, you have to do it, right? Just like you have to cold call or if you're going to do, you know, Crothers' thing is the folders and the drop-ins and the, you know, he's got the whole shtick with the drop-ins. Yeah, it's work. Just no one wants to do it. It's, I don't think it's competing ideas because they're always going to choose the easier one. I don't think it's that they don't have the markets because that's just a bullshit excuse or their area doesn't have enough business or whatever. To me, it is you're either a worker or you're not. The workers figure it out and are looking for nuances to get an edge. And then you have all the non-workers who they're going to read every newsletter you put out. They're going to subscribe to everything you do. They're going to pay for your producer book and your digital marketing inbound guide and, and never do anything. <laughs> I just, I've seen it for so long. I hate to be so pessimistic, but it is, um, I've just, and maybe it's a failing in, in me. And, and I, and I love, that's why I love your brand. I mean, I'm my, I've never done, I don't do as good a job of branding as you guys do. Um, and maybe that's what it is, but like it, I've just never, I just keep coming back to the fact that they just don't want to do the work. They just don't want to actually do it. I don't know. No, I, you know, I, I can only speak for myself and, and, and I, I, I guess, you know, I've been guilty of that through times. Um, I, but like my biggest hurdle and, and the reason why I failed the first two or three years was because I just, I took all this competing advice and I tried to like put Frankenstein this thing together mm -hmm. and, you know, BOR, not to BOR, uh, big firm, small firm. Um, network, cold call. I just kind of did a little bit of everything and it was just this ugly Frankenstein and I never just picked one path and went all in on it. I just did a thousand different things mm -hmm. and I'm a big Hormozzi fan and that's one of the things he talks about, you know, just yeah, like Hormozzi is awesome. Distractions and picking a path and sticking with it. And it wasn't until my fourth year in the industry that I did that. And then I started to experience some success. Like, like I'm not the million dollar producer, or at least not yet. That's Micah. I'm just, the, I'm the marketing and branding guy. I I take his knowledge and I just put a nice little bow on it and an eye patch and I put it out there. Um, but, you know, whether it's, 
whether it is, you know, your stuff, which is like inbound, which I'm fascinated with your stuff. And I'd like to talk about that at some yeah, point. We can, either. Yeah, we can. Um, whether it's that or cold calling or net, whatever it is, you just got to pick one. When you try to do everything, that is a recipe for disaster. So and I, I did that and it damn sure didn't work. So that I completely agree with that. I completely agree. Now, I, um, you said something, you know, your first two or three years, I think you said you, you failed or whatever. Define that for me. Cause you're still here. So you couldn't have fail failed. You know what I mean? Like what, what in your mind, those first two or three years when you would classify those as, as failed. And, and I, and I understand your reasons and all that. What, what, what does that actually mean? Like you didn't hit your goals. You got bounced around agencies. Like what did that actually look like? Yeah, so I um I worked at one of the big ABC shops and um I base I had a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar validation that I had to hit with within three years. And I think I was somewhere around two hundred thousand after three years. Now, side note, I split my entire book with somebody else because I tried to do like this uh team selling model, which we can talk about. So yeah. I brought in yeah. over what my goal was, but I split a lot of revenue. So I made a lot of mistakes from like a mentor mentee spot. Yep. But anyways, so once once that three years was up, it was basically like, okay, you can either hit the road or you can just go straight on your, you know, just go straight production. And so I just went straight on production. And um, so then after year four, after year four yeah so then after year four after you know i wrote some more business and i looked at it and i was kind of like i had an opportunity to go be a part of an agency where i had some equity it was kind of a fresh start i had a lot of dead weight a lot of stuff in my book that i was like you know what starting over wouldn't be bad because I, now i actually know how to build this thing and i would do it differently and so it was kind of just you know i think not that they were ready to move on because they i mean they were bought in and i have enough i have no beef with them at all they helped me in every way that that they knew how it just i just needed a fresh start and i wanted yeah. to start over and when i did that i was like you know what i'm going to take micah's stuff with my fresh start and i'm just going to bring people along for the ride because he had just left his firm a year before that too so it's like hey watch us build our books in real time was kind of the initial thought so i'm going to reframe your first three years as being a failure as that is exactly the way that those first three years should have gone because the first three years in this industry are supposed to suck. You're not supposed to know which path you're the best at. You're not supposed to be anyone who tells you that their first three years out of the gate is either an exception, which do exist, or they're bullshitting you or dad gave them the book. That's it. <laughs> Those are your three options, right? The vast, vast majority of us absolutely get our ass handed to us the first three years. And you're supposed to, because that's where I found my thing is digital marketing, right? That's how I found it. I was fucking terrible. I, I was taught from one of the best old school traditional insurance salesmen. You know, my father, my well, ex-father-in-law, he was just amazing. I mean, this guy had all these little old school tricks that that I still use in a digitized fashion today and just awesome stuff. Just just mind bending. The prospect doesn't even understand what just happened. They're just signing tricks that, you know, that were amazing. And and I don't mean tricks in a nefarious way, just, you know, no, no, ways yeah. of spinning it so that they frame it better and boom. Okay. I still was terrible. Ter 50,000 miles in the car, dropped a million business cards off, cold calling all day, all night. And I was awful at it. It just was not for me. And But during that time and all that pain and suck, that's when I found that with inbound, I could be really, really good at that. And then that catapulted my career forward. I think that when I'm talking about the people who aren't willing to do the work, I'm not talking about their results. I'm talking about the actual effort that they put into figuring out what their thing is. And I think that what you just described is actually, as much as it's terrible, you know, to experience and go through. It's not like you're loving all those moments. You wouldn't be sitting here with a clear plan, understanding how to get to where you want to be in an agency that you have some equity in, you believe in, and a cool and a cool kind of partner in a separate side project like Micah, if you hadn't gone through that shitty time. So like that is to me a very natural path in our in our industry. Um I think unfortunately, and you guys have it on here, 
you have so many people who are in either leg legacy situations or et cetera, who just simply don't know to even do the work that you did. And I think that's where a lot of the problems come from. And then they try to spout off shit like they've actually ever experienced the pain and people listen to them. And it's like that person, you know, I have this saying, I only like to work with people who walk with a limp, right? If, if you haven't been battle tested, if you're not hurting, bruised, battered, you know, you know, an eye patch because you because you've been through war, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to listen to what you have to say. Cause you, you haven't experienced the pain of wanting to just like slam your head off your desk and cry as an adult because of how, because something's not going well, you know, and then build yourself back up from that. So I think that your journey is exactly the journey that everyone should go through. Cause now you know how to do your thing as much as it probably wasn't fun during the time. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I've got a, uh, so I just on, on the personal note. So my wife, is a physician. So she does, she does well. She's a doctor. I've got five kids. I started over at 35 to get into this crazy industry. I'd always been in sales and I'd always been super successful, but like you kind of hit a ceiling there of earning potential in, in, in sales. And then I was like, well, how do I make, how do I make like really good money? And it was like, be a financial advisor or go into commercial insurance or start your own business. Yep. It was one of those three. And so I chose this industry and here I am, I'm three years in, I'd always been successful. I was short of my mark. I've got five kids. My wife just had our fifth kid. She's ready to work less. So now I'm not only am I like trying to do my thing, but I'm trying to replace a doctor's income, a large portion. And like for, for two years, I went to sleep like nauseous. Yeah. You know, how am I like, I'm, I'm failing. This isn't working. What am I doing? And you know, it just, it was a crucible. It was incredibly humbling. Um, but, you know, it, everything happens for a reason. And, you know, it's all going to work out. I know what the hell I'm doing now. Right. So, yeah. Uh, well, see, that's and that's and that's the point. And I don't mean to be so fluffy on this, but like, dude, so many people just never get to that point. Like, you know, that's one of the things that I sit here. And if there's anything about my career that, you know, when I when I sit and I allow myself to get negative. I think about the fact that I've had to restart so many times, like everything, you know, just everything in my life feels like momentum, 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 restart, momentum, momentum, restart. Like that's literally like, I'm, I'm, I've started writing a book. I'm writing a book on, um, uh, discipline and, um, uh, self-discipline, not, not disciplining like your children or whatever. Um, Although I do like to be slapped in the face during sexual encounters. No, uh, I didn't say that out loud. Um, the, uh, no, the, 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 uh, so like I, I'm, I'm, I've started working on this book and, um, and I've started outlining like stories and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, holy, like this through line, like developed, like restart, 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 restart. And I, I started saying to myself and, and thinking about kind of like, here I am 42, about to be 43, like, looking out into the future of where I want to go. And it's like, I know now exactly where I want my life to go, where I want it to be, what's important to me. And I had to go through all that shittiness to figure this out. Cause five years ago, even I didn't know I was surviving, right? I was just, you know, surviving. And I think that so many people never actually, they don't put themselves. This is what I respect so much about what you've done. One, you were, willing and had the guts to restart into a new space at 35 years old. A lot of people don't have the guts for that, right? They would have just stayed where they were and accepted that plateau and kept going. You were willing to restart. You then were willing to push through years of not being performing as well as you would like to perform, right? A lot of people would have pulled the ripcord and said, ah, it's just not for me and left, right? And you've gotten through all that to now say, I know exactly what to do. I know exactly how to get there. I know, and I can put in the work and I've built a network to get there and now I can do it. And I think far too many of us, when when stuff really starts to get hard, and this, this is the part that I've, that I've, I've put just a tremendous amount of thought into, when stuff really starts to get hard, they, they, they pull the ripcord and it's like, nah, right. It's like cliche, but it's like, you're right. There's like, 10 more steps and you're on the other side of the mountain. Like it's right there, you know, and then we give up at that point or we just say, ah, I've gone high enough. I'm good right here. I'll just 
complain, but stay right here. So I don't have to feel any more pain. And, um, you know, it, this industry, you use the word, it is crucible. Like this, that's what this industry is. Like it is going to test every part of you. If you want to be successful, there's no easy path, but I seemingly, when you get to the other side of the mountain, you can have a lot of fun. Yeah. I wrote an article about this, uh, a couple of months ago. It's called the producer's journey. And uh, I got to say, I hijacked it from somebody else and just put a producer spin on it. But basically, you get to this valley of <laughs> the best marketers val- steal, bro. The best right. marketers steal. That's <laughs> yep, yeah. Austin Cleon, I think, is one of the that is Austin but, Cleon. Yep. <laughs> um, but you go through these site, you go through these different stages, and you get down to this valley of despair where you're like, "What am I doing? Why am I doing this?" But the thing is, is like, if you don't see it through. Then you have to, if you pull the cord, as you said, and you start over, now you have to start the cycle all over again. You're yeah. still going to get to the valley of the despair in the new thing. You mm-hmm. just keep punting the ball further and further down the field. And and I had done that my entire life. If something didn't come easy to me, I was a professional athlete. Like, I don't know if you knew that. I played. I didn't. I'll be I honest with you. I don't know really anything about you. That's why I'm loving Fair this enough. conversation so and, much. And you shouldn't because I'm a nobody. Okay. So let's that's, just put that that's not true. You just have a you have a pseudonym that you use. Fair enough. But I had um I had done that in everything in my life. Whenever something if something didn't come natural or easy to me, I quit. And I did it in work because I did a bunch of different industries. I did it in uh, professional baseball. I did it in my marriage. I left my marriage for a year at one time because things got hard and impossible. Thank God, you know, things were reconciled. We now have five beautiful children. But I had done that in every part of my life. And I'm sitting there looking at myself. I'm three years into this industry. And I'm like, fuck, man, you've done this your whole life. Like, at some point, you got to man up and you got to see something through, you know. And I could see the fruits of the marriage piece and what had come from sticking it out. I'm also sober, been in sobriety for 10 years. And so those like the only two things I had ever stuck to. And I could see all this fruit that had been born out of that. And I'm like, fucking do this with your work, man. Like, you got to get through the valley of despair and you got to stick it out. Let's say it doesn't work out with this firm. You know, your max revenue incorporated, you know, whether it's this firm or the other firm, you're doing this for the next 40 years to fucking stick it out. And uh, excuse my language, but um, this is a pro cursing podcast. Okay. All right. So uh, anyways, that's that's kind of the story. So, yeah, it's um, dude. You know? So one, I really appreciate that. And so, you know, I am, don't refer to yourself as a nobody ever again, please. And uh, three, um, I'm very much enjoying getting to know you. Okay. If you had not read it already. Have you ever read this book right here? There's no plan. No. It, might, it might be backwards for you. There's no plan B for your A game by Bo Eisen. Make this the next book that you read. This has been one of the most, this was referred to me by Chris Paradiso. I read it in a weekend. Um, I couldn't put it down. Absolutely couldn't put it down. It also helps that I'm single now. So I have a lot of extra mm-hmm. time to read. Um, okay. so I've just been reading like a fucking madman, but this book is so good. So here, I'll get my takeaway from what you just said that is confirmed in this book. So Bo Eisen was a, a professional athlete as well. He played uh football for, um, uh, started with the Oilers and then went and played for the 49ers. Then he became, a um an award-winning playwright after football and now he's a six-figure speaker and uh like coach guy and not in like the shitty way and like the you know he's he's really yeah. well known works with great people so this is so so this dude's completely legit and his whole shtick and this is what i love about it is is and this is what i took away from this book if i'm gonna put it in a nutshell but i still recommend you read it you need to think of yourself at all times as you are the best, the best, right? You're the best producer. You're the best producer trainer. You're the best husband. Whatever the things that are important to you are, you frame your brain at all times as you are the best and are going to be the best. Because what it does is is it does uh, a couple things. Um, one, you have to get rid of everything in your life that doesn't allow you to be the best at that. So if you're the if you want to be the best husband, and alcohol, pot, uh, porno, um, a group of buddies are keeping you from being the best husband because they take you off the path, you can get rid of them. 
because they don't allow you to be the best husband or spouse or whatever, you know, if you're, yep. if you're a woman or whatever. Um, so, so that's one thing. The second thing is it forces you to extend your timeline because no one gets to be the best in a year. No one gets to be the best in three years. Mm. He said he sets for his life 20 year timelines to be the best. And when you think, and, I, and this is what I love about what you just said, and it's why I grabbed this book because it, it's what you just said. Like you're going to be Max Revenue Inc. for 40 years. You're going to be 40 years out, right? When you set your timeline for 20 years, you now don't go, oh shit, I'm, things aren't working out the way I want right now. I'm going to pull the ripcord. You go, I just got to work through it. I got to figure out, I got, I got 17 more years. I got 15 more years of this. I got to figure it out. And by forcing... By, by focusing on being the best and narrowing your focus and in, 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 onto what allows you to be the best and extending your timeline, right? You now have this, you now are, are dialed in to what you do and you have the mindset of a, a setback is just a setback. You have, you have 10 more years, 18 more years to do this thing. Who cares if you're having yeah. a bad six months or a bad three months or even a bad year? Because- you have to figure it out because you're not stopping for so much more time. And um, man, I'll tell you, I have, it, it, and he just pounds it into your head in a really readable way. That's why I like this book. Cause I don't like books that just dive into stuff. It's like melts your brain. It's like, it's too much. I don't need all that. But those two concepts for me, like, I feel like I've been like, I felt like I'd been kind of like floating around them for a while. And when he kind of lined them up that way, I was like, holy shit, that's the thing. Like, you got to find the thing that you want to be the best at, cut everything else out for the most part, or at least su supremely focused, extend your timeline. And now the bad days aren't bad days. There's just a freaking moment in time. Who cares? I, you know, oh, I got all this more time. It, it was really, uh, to be honest with you, uh, uh, very, very moving. It sounds kind of like um, Benjamin Hardy's 10x is easier than 2x. Uh, another, I got that book's right here too. That 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 so book was a game changer for me as well. Future self, right? Yep. So you decide who you want to be and where you want to go, kind of like you alluded to earlier, and then and then that person or that thing that then becomes your rubric for all of the decisions that you make in the present. Yep. And so yep. I just uh, it's similar. They're they're kind of getting at the same thing. I I, yep. I really. I'll give you another one, Darren Hardy. Come on, camera. Darren Hardy's. Uh, th this is this is an all timer, right? Um, sorry, I got one of these cameras that like adjusts on your face, and it'll come back around in a sec. Um, Darren Hardy's the compound effect. Um, yeah. This is an old you know, classic. This has been around for more than a decade. Super fast read as well, but it's the same concept. Pick a thing, do the thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and eventually. You, 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 you look around and you've accumulated so much talent, experience, relationships, money, whatever, that you're just so much farther than everybody else. And, um, that to me is a, a uh, it's that, you know, th these are some of the things that like, you know, I, I have worked very hard to try to like teach my kids some of these concepts and really, even though they're young, start to integrate into their lives because no one freaking tells them this stuff. Like school's not telling our kids, even even training classes. Like when you go and go to like a sales, <laughs> for the people that are listening at home, I have one of these cameras that follows your face. And when I bent over to get the book, it followed me and it didn't come back. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. It's all good. It's um, all good. I'll look at you writing. Yeah, yeah. You can look at my my cool American t-shirt. Um, but like even sales training courses, um, do not they they don't properly express like how difficult it's going to be. You know what I mean? Like they don't, they don't, um, they don't tell you, look guys, they, you know, they give you like, here's the five steps to, to sell something. What they don't say is you're going to suck at this for a decade and then you're going to get good. But if you can make it that decade, you'll, your all your wildest dreams come true. Your wife will drive a set the, the newest seven series every year. You'll have a boat and a second home. Your kids will all go to private school. Your friends will all envy you, even though they used to make fun of you for selling insurance, right? Like they don't tell you that, they, you know, but it's going to take that long. So. Yeah. There's no manual for this thing, you yeah. know? And so 
you just you figure it out or you quit. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah. So um, let's talk about the the max revenue letter because I find it to be intriguing. You know, in my you know I've known Micah for maybe three years, five years, a while. I can't even remember the first time I interviewed him. Um, but then I saw him coming out, and obviously I didn't know when you guys first launched it. You know, I didn't know if there was anybody else with him. You know, there wasn't like a lot of I didn't really know what was going on. What has been like the most surprising reaction to it from you guys? Like, are people just all in? It's all good. Are you getting any pushback on some of the ideas? Like, just what is what is surprised you when you start creating like this and putting out on a regular basis, you get a lot of interesting cats that start to reach out to you and respond. So I'm just interested, like, what have you guys been experiencing? Yeah. So um, this isn't my first foray into like branding and internet marketing. I had done it in another space a while back and I ended up letting that die. Um, it was in the faith space, believe it or not, despite what my language may sound like, but it, I just didn't feel right. Um, that just, it never felt right. So anyway, so I, so I built up a pretty big, audience before and that's why i told micah like let's do this i can i can i can build us an audience we just need to take your credibility and what you know let me package it put it out so anyways all that to be said um it's it's been wild um the, one of the big industry magazines reached out to us to do like a spotlight we're doing that soon um we get a ton of ba what we get a lot of is we get a lot of new producers or producers who have struggled that want a different way to do things yeah. because this message of, Hey, most of these people out here telling you how to do it, were spoon fed and you just don't know it. And yeah. by the time you know it, it's too late. Yeah. Um, and so there, so this idea of building it through cold outbound people um, have really taken to it. So that's been great. Um, it's um, we were kicked off LinkedIn and, um, about four months into this thing because I used a non-politically correct word. And uh, so we had to start over. So what you see on LinkedIn is actually us starting over four or five months in. What was it? What was the word? Retarded. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I miss that word actually. And I said it on purpose. You know, yeah. I am, I intentionally twist the knife with things because I'm trying to make a ruckus. Uh, because just to be quite honest with you, this industry is so fucking boring. Yeah. You know, and everybody's got the same take and, you know, there's not like, there's just a lot of sacred cows that need to be killed. And um, so, yeah, so that's what we did. Now I have toned it down a little bit because I don't want to get canceled again. Um, that wasn't fun, but um, yeah, the response was, the response has been great. Mike and I get, I don't know, messages daily from producers. Yeah. Like, hey, what do you think about this? Or how would you do this? Or whatever. And so, I mean, the, the one little product we have is like a 195 bucks. Like, we ain't trying to get rich off this thing. That's the last thing that we're trying to do. We just genuinely are wanting to help because it's a fucking slog out there. You know, it's a slog. And uh, yeah, it's it's going over well. If, if anything, the response has been so overwhelming that I'm having to pump the brakes because... I don't want it to get in. I don't want it to interfere with the main thing, which is me building my book. Yeah. So I'm having to really be diligent and organized with my time. Yeah. And that's for, for those of you who are listening, who are interested, that's the producer playbook. Um, you can go to uh, max. So if they go to max revenue letter, I know it's a dot beehive right now, but if they just go to max revenue letter, does that bring them over? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, cool. So you just go to max revenue letter you'll see sign up for the email list. It's awesome. Um, I, I love it. And, and I still want to keep chatting for, for a couple more minutes, but I just want, since we're at the spot, um, definitely subscribe. It's free. And then the producer playbook. I know um, I was actually, I just haven't gotten into it. I have 10 million things going on at work, but I was going to get it for some of my, for my production team. And I know other people that have already used it and love it. And uh, um, a couple of good buddies of mine. Um, so there's great content in there. So I definitely want to, Highly recommend uh, that if you're interested in these ideas and and you want a good a good uh, a good template, um, that producer playbook has gotten great reviews from from everybody I know. Um, and there's there's lots of people on there that have reviews as well. So um, definitely want to give a big shout out to that. Uh, so you know, talk to me a little bit about where you see this going. So I mean, 
you guys have definitely made a stir, right? Um, there's a lot of people in the industry, uh, like you said, who come in. There's like 10 bazillion podcasts. Um, you know, I have been slowly moving this podcast away from like insurance specific content. I still love talking to people that are really interesting to me in the insurance industry. And I look at it more like, and again, I don't mean take, take the, take the hubris out of this comment, but I think of it kind of like the way Joe Rogan does his podcast. Like I'm not really interested in his fight night podcast. That's not really what I, that's not why I listen to him. I like the other stuff. So I kind of skip those ones. So like, I want to keep doing ones that are insurance specific, but then I want to do other ones around it because our entire industry is filled with the same crap. Just like they call it. Well, what do you do? Oh, I ask for referrals. Well, what technology do you use? I'm on agency zoom. Well, why are you there? You know what I mean? It's just like, ah, oh my God. You know what I mean? Like it just makes me want to barf, but you guys have come out with a new spin, the flavor, the, 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 the eye patch guy, you know what I mean? Like the whole thing is counter to our yeah. industry, which I love. I mean, I adore it. I think it's phenomenal. That's um, the idea. Yeah. And so, so, you know, where do you see you? You obviously have people's attention. That's that's only going to pick up. I'm sure. Um, where do you see this going? Like, do you do you see this becoming a training program? Do you see it becoming a consultancy? Is it you know just continue to grow and see what happens and kind of play it by ear? Like, have you guys kind of mapped out? And as much as you're willing to share, you know. Oh no, I'm I'm an open book. Uh, uh, to be honest, with you, we're just going to kind of see where. You know, see where it takes us. Um, I know that uh, we're both, both of our number one priority right now is regrowing our books. So that's priority number one. This is just kind of like uh, extra on the side, just because I like making a ruckus and I like doing it. Um, yeah. We like doing it, I should say that. But we've had, dude, we've had a lot of agencies reach out to us and offer us quite a bit of money to come out and train their guys and all. And we may do all that one day. I'm just kind of like right now, I'm trying to build my book. And Mike is trying to rebuild his book. We're just sharing as we go along. Um, and then whatever comes of it is what comes of it. You know, if yeah. it turns into some great consulting firm, whenever that's time to happen, it'll happen. You know, yeah. like, um, but, you know, we're going to both get our books to a million. And then once it gets there, then we'll see what the cards have in store for us. I love that. I mean, to me, you know, that is how the best consultancies work group Pro, you know, our, our workshop programs, whatever, that's how the best, you know, I look at uh, Mick Hunt. So Mick Hunt is one of my very best friends and I, and I love Mick. Uh, one of the, literally one of the best humans I ever met in my life. This dude's done it twice, right? Literally built an agency once, once as a team member, employee, kind of uh, uh, head of operations that did it again on his own agency, then did it again. And, and everything that he talks about is based off his own beats, right? You can hear it in the way he talks about it. You can hear like, I've said it the wrong way and gotten, to, you know, the door shut in my face this many times to learn how to say it the right way. And now I'm teaching you, like you can, you can hear it in the nuances and the way people talk versus just, you know, other people that I know for a fact overestimate their numbers just so they can sh seem like they've done something so they can put a program together. And then when they talk, you're, it feels, you know, it feels an inch deep and, um, I, that to me feels like the right way. What your guys doing that, that feels like, cause you could, you could figure out, you don't want to do freaking workshops. Cause you know what? Workshops take you away from your family. Workshops are, do a tremendous amount of mind space. You know, that, that kind of stuff is, is yeah. you know, once you have it built, you can kind of do it multiple times. But like uh, another good buddy of mine, uh, Matt Namoli, he and his um, partner uh, at GNN insurance, Zach Gould, they created the Bobble On program to teach people about their referral. They, their whole shtick was building referral partners. And like they did that for a year and a half, two years were highly successful. I mean, they made a, they made, they did, they did a really good job for people and made a lot of money, but they got toasted on it. You know what I mean? It just did so much, the travel and the, it, you know, there's a lot there and it takes you away from your family. So I think you guys are going about it the right way. That's, I actually am excited for you that that's the way you're doing it versus like, in five years or in three years, we want to have this many clients or whatever. I feel like you start to skip steps when you do it that way. Yeah. Whatever's going to happen will happen. Right. And a lot of times opportunities present themselves that you never even could have imagined. And so that's kind of the path that we're taking. Like at the end of the day, I, I think this is the best industry in the world. You can make a damn good living uh, for 20, 30 hours a week. Yeah. Like, you know, like 
So if I can make a half a million, you know, if I can grow a million dollar book, two million dollar book, make half a million dollars to a million dollars a year and work 30 you know, hours a week, that's a pretty good living, right? So if anything comes above that with max revenue and, you know, it that turns out to be some great thing too, well, that's great, but but I don't need it, you know? Yeah. So it's it's just what we say where I'm from, it's land yap. It's, it's a little something extra. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So um, let's say I'm listening to this. I'm a young producer or I'm struggling or, or I've been thinking about doing cold outreach. Like when you guys, your philosophy, right? Where, where, what's like maybe one, one separator that you found not, not to give away, you know, I don't want you to give away. I'll give it all away. I don't care. So, um, good. I like, I like that. I like that too. That's my philosophy as well. Um, so what's, what's one, what's one thing that for you having now been in the, been in the, you know, feeling like you're starting to, you know, really starting to figure it out enough to, to talk about it. Right. Like what's one thing that you feel like a lot of people get wrong or, or is like a nuanced issue that that people tend to miss that that can make a big impact. Like, what's one of those one of those things for you? Okay, so unless your last name is Kardashian or Biden, you're not. You have a. You're probably not going to network your way into validation, right? And for validation being at most firms, they give you a three to five year window at which you had a you have to hit a certain revenue target, or else they let you go or you go on a draw. And I mean, you've really, really got to have some connections to be able to pull that off. So then what happens is you get a lot of young producers, they look at the other guys in the office and they don't see the receipts for how those other guys in the office built their book. By the time they do know how they built the book and they see behind the curtain, they realize that a lot of guys were tapped on accounts or brought in on accounts or whatever. And I have no beef against those guys. Like I throw shade on them in my posts, but that's just to make a ruckus. Honestly, if somebody wanted to give me a million dollar book, I would not take it, you know? So, (laughs) yeah. So anyways, so what you got to realize is that if you don't have that networking ability, if you, if your dad's not the head of lending at some big local bank or what, like if you're just what I say, the rest of us, the 95%, you've got to build it with cold outbound, in my opinion. Now, you're a different story with the small business and the whatever. And I really want to hear about that. But if you're a middle market guy, you're going to have to do some level of outbound. And in that outbound, it's a, and I know this is a bitter pill, but it's a volume game, man. You just, you have to, whether you like it or not, there has to be a certain number of calls. Uh, So I found my sweet spot to be around the 25 to 30 a day. Micah does more like 40 or 50. We have different targets. We have different niches that we go after, but, I would say, look at your agency. Where do you guys have success? What niches do you have where you have all of the markets? Once you know that, build a prospect list of 300 to 400 names. Start banging out 25 to 50 calls a day. And if you make enough calls, you will find somebody who's in pain. And that's low-hanging fruit. You can go in there and solve that problem. And then as you as you make those calls and you build up that cold calling and you learn how to get through objections, then you can start to convert some people who... Maybe they're not unhappy with their agent, but they're at least willing to let you yeah. take a peek under the hood. Um, they have like unrealized pain, maybe unrealized yes. pain. It's kind of like a doctor, right? Like you got three people, you got people that are healthy. they know they're healthy and they don't care what you're selling. You got people who are like, ah, I might not be healthy. I'm willing to do a checkup. And then you got people who are just in pain. You know, when you, you're looking at, when you first get started, you're looking for the third. But as you get better and you develop your cold calling skills or cold emailing or whatever you choose, you can start to pick off some of those in the middle, right? That are kind of undecided. So that's all I would say. It's it's nothing revolutionary. It's nothing crazy. Anybody who's in SaaS sales or uh, I, I was in ticket sales in minor league baseball for a while. Anybody who's done a lot of cold outbound, they already know this. But for some reason, our industry has taken a hell of a long time to catch up. It's ego. And it's ego. Let me say one, Let me say one more thing. You got to also remember that when these older guys in your these older guys in your office built their book, they did it in a different time, right? They joined the country club. They were part of the social clubs. Everybody knew two to three guys. Now, thanks to this little invention called the internet, everybody knows 10 to 15 brokers. You've got to do something that stands out mm-hmm. above other people, right? Because everybody is getting the LinkedIn requests and whatever. And that's having the right message at the right time to the right person. Right. Yeah. Even if they play golf with 10 other guys at the country club, if you're the guy that calls them when they get that work comp audit and they're furious, guess who they're going to take a meeting with? It's going to be you. 
Yeah. They're they're not going to pick up the phone and and call three or four other people that they know. But if you're the guy that calls, you're going to be the guy that gets to me. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And and to be honest with you, the the so so uh, just on my ego comment, we have this weird thing in our industry, and I only know this from all the hate that I've gotten over my career for pushing inbound. We have this ego thing that the best producers, the best agencies, work off of referrals. If you work off anything other than referrals and somehow you're not doing your job, there is this really odd thing that like, I can't wrap my head around. Cause like, I literally, I've heard the argument. I've heard the, I've gotten the comments. Um, actually Cass and I were talking the other day cause we had a bunch of young podcasters that we kind of talked to and yeah, I shouldn't say young, young in podcasting. And we were like, we were kind of giving them shit because we're like, you guys don't understand how easy you have it today. When I started podcasting 10 years ago, literally there's there's an article in the insurance journal which specifically references Cass and I hating on what we're doing, advocating for inbound marketing, right? Like the one of the largest publications in our industry wrote an article hating on us for advocating for inbound marketing. So like this, this idea of like, you, if you're if you're referral based, that means you do a good job and you're like a good agency. And people who have to cold call or do inbound, they just can't figure it out. And that's like why they have to do that. So I do think that there's a big part of that. And unfortunately, that gets perpetuated. But um, to your point, you, you asked about inbound, right? The yeah. same exact philosophy that you just described, replace outbound with inbound. And it works for the same exact reasons. The difference is some shoppers need to be called. Some shoppers go to the internet, which is why I advocate yep. for both. I advocate for you need to have an inbound and you need to have an outbound. And I think the inbound is a derivative of your outbound. So you call and the guy gives you an objection, right? Write it down. Answer that question in an inbound, in, an e in, a, in a YouTube video, put it on YouTube. You call and you get three, write those three down. Boom, 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 boom. Answer that, right? And, and literally the inbound is just answering these calls because what's going to happen is you're going to, again, maybe not that specific person, but all the people who, who you, that person is one of 10,000, 100,000 people who have that same objection, question, whatever, right? So that guy then goes to the internet and goes, what is this experience mod thing? Bam, now he finds your video, right? Watches your video. Now he calls you. Or when you call, he's seen your video. She's seen your video. So the idea is they work for the same exact reason. The difference is I, you're trying, you're trying through volume to drop in in a moment of pain, but you're going to have a higher per, per, per interaction hit ratio. What I'm saying, what, what I'm saying is yes, you have to do that. And in addition, you add inbound as a derivative of your outbound. And what you get is they now on their time get to do the same exact thing, right? So now 10 p.m., this guy's got his kids to bed. He's looking through his doc and he's going, what the freak? I'm, what, our mod went up again this year? Like, what is going on? What is an experience mod? Why is it important? And now your videos are showing up, your content is showing up, and he's going, who is this freaking Ryan Hanley guy? What is this agency? I need to call these guys. And then all of a sudden I get an email. And it's like, it's the same concept just just capturing either side of the equation in my opinion so i'm fascinated by that and i so i was reading where you know what the second biggest search engine is YouTube. behind google youtube right whenever you and and, and the reason why i know why i know that is because i at one time with one of these other projects i was running facebook ads and all this stuff and the and they were talking about why YouTube ads are so much more profitable. And it's because it's actually intent based. When someone goes on YouTube, they're, they have a problem and they are searching X, Y, Z. Whereas on Facebook or Instagram, you're scrolling and you're shaking your head. You know, this is exactly. Yeah. So, so it's intent based. So that lead that comes your way off of YouTube is so much more valuable and your conversions are so much higher. So I've been fascinated with that. And I reached out to you like a year ago or six months ago to try to pick your brain on it. And we've just never been able to link up here. Can I run you through a couple of my objections Do and it. hear your response? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hit me, hit me. Yeah, this is fun. Okay, so mid -market. I also now feel like a dick for not for not for us not connecting. I don't know why no. that happened. I'm sorry. No, it's it's fine, bro. <laughs> it's, it's all good. Everything in its due time, right? right. So it's fine. Um, so 
most of what I chase is between 10,000 in revenue and a hundred thousand in revenue, mm -hmm. which then shrinks your buyer pool considerably, mm -hmm. right? From small business. Now you just told me about, uh, Gordon Coyle, which I yeah. totally get that. Let's say I focus in manufacturing. Yep. How many CFOs or directors of operations or whatever in manufacturing are going to go and search that type of video? Cause I, at least what I think about it, and it's probably wrong thinking, I'm thinking, oh, that $50,000 manufacturing CFO, he already knows that answer. He's not looking for that on YouTube. Is yeah, that no. a false belief? Yeah, that's 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 uh, projecting a perceived reality onto what actually is reality. So they're all humans, right? So I run an agency with 25 people. I Google HR shit all the time. Shouldn't I know? I'm a four-time executive, two-time CEO. I have 25 people. I I don't know. I don't know shit about HR, right? So like an HR software might be like, ah, oh, we don't have to answer that question. A guy with 25 employees, he should know the answer to that question. I don't freaking know. I go to YouTube and I go, can I, how do I get rid of this? How do I get rid of this person? You know? So like yeah. the point is they're just people, right? And they're good at some things, not at others. And some of them will know, some of them won't know. Here's the thing, dude. You only need one person to watch that video and reach out to you to, to win the account. So like Mr. Beast is going to have 10 bazillion views. Your video might have 100. But if it's the right 100 people, that's all that matters to you. You don't need a bazillion people to watch your video to get a million dollar book. You need the right 100 people to watch your video to get a million dollar book especially if you do, if you layer those videos appropriately, right? So like take that manufacturer with 50 million in revenue, figure out what the top 20 questions that they have are, right? Figure out what the top 20 questions are. You can actually end, and I did this for a while, uh, I did this back at the Murray Group. I um, did a little bit at Rogue actually too, so I want to be clear about that. I, when I did an outbound prospecting call that wasn't going well, and I could kind of feel that it wasn't going well, I would actually, I would actually reverse course. And I would say, hey, sounds to me like you're you're in a good spot and I'm super happy for you. Can I just can I just ask you one question? Cause this, you know, just, just while I have you and it has nothing to do with you buying insurance for me. Most of the time they'll say yes. And you'll go, what's I like to create content um about this stuff and I like to answer questions. What's like one question that you have that I that like that that you commonly have? And a lot of times they'll they'll go, you know what? I, I really struggle with the idea of blah. They'll put it. Bam, write it down. I just got another question. Now I know what a potential prospect could potentially search on YouTube um, for, 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 you know, that I want to put out there. And then you create a playlist, you answer those 20 videos and you do it over and over, you know, and people will go, well, ah, isn't it all small business? Well, from a volume perspective, yes, it is going to be more small business. But if you have a way to filter it, one, so a lead comes in and it's a $500 bot. Send it to a rookie unless you want to write that stuff, right? We write it because that's our model. But like I tell people all the time, you don't have rookies in your organization. Just send it to a rookie. Refer it to a buddy down the street who's just getting started. He wants to write that stuff, right? Like that's good. But the other piece is you can say, uh, you know, you're dude, you're freaking great at headlines. Like what what uh, the the missing piece to a workers' compensation policy for manufacturers with more than 20 employees. That's a, not the best title, but you get the idea, right? I get it, yeah. Target it to exactly what you want, right? Uh, how we saved a $50 million manufacturer 11% on their insurance. And then tell that story. And then do it again and again and again and target those people. And um, what you're going to sue is you're going to put it out there and you're going to get 25 views. And what a lot of people do, especially people listening to this podcast, what they do is, is they'll say, oh, I'm only getting 25 views. You need it to be, you need one person out of, you're not going to get 100,000 views. You need one person to like it, to, 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 to see it. And then boom, do 100 videos. If one person who's a good prospect for you contacts you on every video you create and you create 100 videos, you just got 100 perfect prospects into your agency. That's it. Yeah. And and here's the so the beauty of it as well is I'm I'm like you make it once and it goes forever. Forever. Right? It only it's you know, you write a blog post, it goes to the bottom of your feed. 
you put out a, a social media post, it goes to the bottom. Your YouTube is like the, the thing that keeps paying you because it only gets more valuable the longer it sits there. Yep. And it only ranks higher and higher the longer it sits there. And I'm not trying to create a bunch of copycats, but I know I know the value of it. I just talked myself out of it for yep. forever. Yeah, so this is what I used to say from stage all the time when I talked about this topic is I'd say, I think of every blog post, every YouTube video, because I because blog posts, if you're ranking proper for SEO, there is, yeah, 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 yeah. Too. but like, so Bad I think example. of every blog post, every YouTube video as a salesperson working for me 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they don't take vacations, they don't get sick, they don't take paternity or maternity leave, they don't get pissy, they don't take smoke breaks. They are working 24 hours a day, seven days a week selling for you. And when you create your headlines, when you fill out your description of a YouTube video, when you put calls to action in a YouTube video, think of it as a salesperson. Every single one is a salesperson. And if you build them that way, people will contact you, right? Like the, another mistake, and uh, I got to wrap up here in a second, um, just to be fair to the audience and, and fair to you. I got to go pick my kids up from school, but um. One of the things that I see a lot of times when people will send me their videos, they don't actually ask for the business. Two, two things, actually. They don't tell people who they are and they don't ask for a business. They just start talking. And then at the end, they just end it. And every single templateize this shit. I do. I use the hook reward return uh, or hook retain reward model. So it's like the hook is the first sentence. Today, we're going to talk about how small business owners can save 25% on their workers' compensation tomorrow. Here we go. Bam. There's the start. Then there's a little tiny bump. And then I said, hi, my name is Ryan Hanley, founder and president of Rogue Risk, where we do insurance differently, specifically by giving you knowledge and information to make the right insurance decision. Now they know exactly who we are. Then I retain them by giving them the information. At the end, we get the payoff, which is if you like this kind of relationship with your insurance broker, we would love to work with you. We're in all 50 states, so we can come to where you are. And we have many ways to get a hold of us. You can give us a call, you blah, 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 blah. Whichever way you choose, we look forward to working with you. Every single video is exactly the same. If you watch them, there's like 475 videos on our YouTube channel. That is the framework for every single video. I say it over and over and over and over again because it's easy, it's clean, it's consistent, and that's what people want. They're not looking for flashy, showy, crazy camera angles, decent audio, decent video, clear, concise answer. Give me what I need. Get out the door. I'm telling yep. you this shit works. It works every friggin' time. Yep. All right. I'm going to do it. Yes. And if you have any questions, bro, just reach out. I promise this time I will take, <laughs> take your call. <laughs> the um, big league in the shit out of me. Oh, oh no, I did. I don't trust me. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I'm, uh, I'm just kidding. I'm I just uh, kidding. But no, dude, it has been so much fun. I'm glad we have had a chance to connect. I've loved getting to know you. This will not be the last time we chat. I, I love what you guys are doing. And um, I'm so happy to share uh, what you're up to with the audience. Um, what are the places where they can find more about you, more about about Max Revenue, like the whole thing? Like, just take me through it. Just go on LinkedIn uh, and go to our profile page, the company page. All the links are there, or you can go to maxrevenueletter.beehive.com and everything will be in the heading. Um, if you like what you have to say, great. And if you don't, that's fine too. There's plenty of ways to do this thing. And um, if you don't like our way, that's fine. Go find another one. It's all good. Awesome, bro. Appreciate you. Be good. All right, bro. Appreciate it. I'm going to Shaboom's.